Hey, you little miracles. It's October 4th, and I wasn't going to record today. However, a new message came out from the UN Secretary General, which I found suitable to speak on my channel since, you know, I've been documenting this whole collapse thing for several years now. I do notice that a lot of my subscribers and potentially new meat sauce viewers come from Nature Bats Last and Paul Beckwith, who just uploaded was it yesterday or last night? Covering tipping points. You can go back through the YouTube search field and look for that. Pretty good one. I try to condense the same information down to a easily digestible palette. Um, my viewership is a little more on the raucous side. Not so many retired boomers, but I appreciate all of you nonetheless. So let's just get into it. Today's article comes from AP News. The UN chief warning life is in life world is in life or death struggle for survival. UN Secretary General warned Monday that the world is in a quote life or death struggle for survival as climate chaos gallops ahead and accuse the world's wealthiest 20 countries of failing to do enough to stop the planet from overheating. The UN chief said emissions of global warming greenhouse gases are at an all-time high and rising, and it's time for a quantum-level compromise between rich, developed countries that emitted most of the heat-trapping gases and emerging economies that often feel its worst effects. Guterres spoke at the government representatives opened a meeting in Congo's capital, Kinshasa, Kinshasa to prepare the world UN-led climate conference in an Egyptian resort in the Egyptian resort of Sharm El Sheikh in November. It's time for immense climate impacts. It's a time of immense climate impacts around the world from floods that put one third of Pakistan underwater and Europe's hottest summer in 500 years to hurricanes and typhoons that have hampered Philippines, Cuba, US, state of Florida, not to forget Nova Scotia, among other places. In the last few weeks, Guterres has amped up push for climate version, asking polluters to play for what they've done, usually called loss and damage. And he said Monday that people need action now. Quote, failure to act on loss and damage will lead to more loss and trust and more climate damage. This is a moral imperative that cannot be ignored. He said in the meeting in Egypt that it must be a place for action on loss and damage. Yes, action that we've been seeing in the past COP26s. In unusual critical language, he said commitments. Do I sound like someone else in this space? I think I do. I'm, he's rubbing off on me a little bit. He said commitments by the so-called G20 group of the world's 20 leading countries are coming far too little and far too late. He warned that pledges and policies are shutting the door on our chances to limit global temperature rise to 2 degrees Celsius, let alone meet the 1.5 degree goal. Side note, where we pass numerous tipping points. Again, Shout out to Mr. Beckwith for his tipping points video. Also me and everyone else in this space who's covering this because, boy, do we have a ignorant and arrogant population here in the States. Quote, we are, this is back to the article. We are in a life or death struggle for our own safety today and our survival tomorrow. COP27 is a place for all countries continuing, led by the G20, to show they're in this fight and in it together. Are we really in it together, guys? Gutierrez said, and the best way to showing is to show up at COP27 at a luxury resort. You know, to eat well. I into this much further, but just skipping ahead, he says, otherwise, he says, negotiations, negotiations are headed for interminable gridlock. Deep sigh. Sigh deeply. We're reaching a breaking point. So how real is this climate change thing? We'll hear from IOPscience.org, a letter, Open Access, title reads, Greater than 99% consensus on human caused climate change in peer-reviewed scientific literature. Let's read the abstract briefly. Describing climate change from a data set of 88,125 climate-related papers since 2012 when this 
question was last addressed comprehensively. We, exam we examined a randomized set of 30,000 such publications. We also used a second sample weight approach, and that was specifically bi biased with keyboard keywords to help identify any skeptical peer-reviewed papers in the whole data set. We identify four skeptical papers out of a subset of 3,000. Four out of 3,000 that are skeptical. It's always been happening. It's all bullshit. We identify four papers as evidenced by abstracts that were rated as implicitly or explicitly skeptical of human cause global warming. In our sample, we utilized pre-identified skeptical keywords. We found 28 papers that were implicitly or explicitly skeptical. We conclude with high statistical confidence that the scientific consensus on human caused contemporary climate change expressed as a proportion of the total publications exceeds 99% of the peer reviewed scientific literature. Is 99% good enough for you? Clearly not. But museums are cool, art, human history, all that. About to just wipe the slate clean, guys. EOS, uh, this next pa uh, page from EOS Science News by AGU. Where's AGU? I know this. I know this. American Geophysical Union. I knew that. New research shows that calving from West Antarctica's pine sheet. Oh, I'm sorry. The headline is melting below the Pine Island ice shelf mines the gap. New bueno. New research shows that increasing calving from the West Antarctic's pine island ice shelf will likely drive increased circulation of warm water and melting below the ice, published by Sarah Darun. And I'm just going to read a brief kind of synopsis here. Uh, the Pine Island Ice Shelf, P-I-I-S, is the seaward extension of the Pine Island Glacier. Seaward extension, a large and rapidly retreating glacier that drains part of the West Antarctic ice sheet. Beneath the floating P-I-I-S is a seafloor ridge that narrows the gap through which relatively warm seawater from the open ocean can flow in and circulate beneath the ice shelf. Well, that's no bueno. This narrative narrowing helps protect the underside of the PIIS on the landward side of the seafloor ridge from melting. But in the past decade, the ice shelf has seen large amounts of calving, calving causing the ice sheet to retreat towards the continent and approach to the ridge, and the calving shows no sign of slowing, as does none. And so this paper, Bradley et la, is investigating, let me click on that and see what that is. Um, what they did was use the high resolution ocean model to simulate ocean circulation and melt rates below the ice shelf modeling and comparing results from both an idealized setting meant to represent the most important features of the ice shelf and the ridge and the real world conditions that closely match the site characteristics for the PIIS. They found that the ice shelf melt rate are sensitive to the thickness of the gap between the PIIS and the seafloor ridge, suggesting that the change geometry of the gap with a retreating ice front leads to the strengthening of seawater circulation beneath the ice. As the calving from the PIIS continues and the front continues, the melt rate will increase linear, linearly, the team found, becoming 10% becoming ten percent higher than it is now by the time the ice retreats from the ridge line. And yes, this highlights that calving could be an important contributor to melting of the West Antarctic ice sheet. So what I gather here is that warm water is circulating, getting in the cracks and crevices of one of the biggest glaciers that will affect seawater, uh, sea level rise, and it's happening. This is the paper, Influence on Pine Island, Ice Shelf, and Basal Melting. So you guys can go through that on your own. This is from Gale, uh, just random scientific papers. I just typed in climate change scientific papers looking for material and um, severe flooding. Uh, human populations would also face serious problems. Loss of farmland, for example, would cause major disruptions in the food supply, bringing about famine in many areas. More frequent and intense heat waves could result in more heat-related deaths, etc., etc. Going on into more articles here. Uh, this is from Candle Canadel Pep uh, can be stopped if we try harder. But the work is it's about to start right now. But then the following paper, this this just you know throws a wrench in the chain, uh, to use the phrase. 
Thomas Cow, politicians use climate change as an excuse to limit personal freedom. He argues in his viewpoint that politicians use the issue of climate change as an excuse for government to interfere the lives of private citizens. No, it's the government. They're trying to change us. Freedom and liberty. Is that annoying? Yeah, it's really annoying seeing it daily. And last but not least, just jumping over to climate and economy for a quick second. The f October 4th update, lots of economy news here. The unit's called on central banks not to increase interest rates and depart from monetary policy being pursued by a large number of Western regulators, including the Bank of England. The recession, a recession worse than that experience of the after the global financial crisis could result from monetary regulators tightening policy and hiking interest rates. That's what they want. More high, higher interest rates, higher interest rates. That's, that's the theme that we've been hearing nonstop. Um, it, but that is also adds to a global debt crisis because everything's more expensive and you're paying more for longer, even though we only have until 2030 to curb emissions. Um, energy, junk, debt, um, the price of groceries could surge 1.7 billion pounds due to the cost of carbon dioxide rising as much as 3,000%. Because liquid CO2, if it remains high, it's an expensive thing. Huge turnout reported at UK cost of living protests. Don't blame them. Uh, there could be a significant risk of gas shortages this, this winter. We know this. Uh, Europe at epicenter of global manufacturing slump. Worst ever bird flu crisis in Europe raises risk for next question. I mean, next season. And China's property crash is a slow motion disaster. Protests, protests, um, protests. What, what do you need to know, guys? The last here are the last news posts from Panopticon. A new final financial crisis may be on the horizon. Quote, previous global financial crises have tended to start, to start in dark corners of the system and vastly increased financialization of almost everything means the system is now as opaque and potentially dangerous given the levels of global volatility and certainty and uncertainty as it has ever been. Meanwhile, these uh, dingbat politicians keep getting elected keep fighting for the corporate interests and not the people. Pretty dismal outlook. All right? The world is in a life or death struggle for survival. Remember those words. When you go out shopping, applying for jobs, asking him or her out, we're in a survival. This has been your October 4th update. Thanks for watching. Hit like and subscribe. I'll keep reporting every day as often as I can. I might take a few days off and I'll talk to you guys later. Ciao.